evening. Um, Fred and I are going to say a couple words. We're going to have two panels. The first panel is going to be two Chinese scientists. We're going to have uh, Yi Guangzhu, who's the director of the Sustainable Energy Program and an engineering professor at Princeton University. And we have Xi Xiaoxing, Xi Xi Xiaoxing, um, professor of physics from Temple University, who, as you know, was charged by the FBI, and then the charges were dropped, and he has been suing the FBI. The moderator for that first panel is Aaron Wolfson, who's a partner with King and Wood Mallisons, and a former prosecu prosecutor in the DA's office. Um, and then the second panel I'm going to moderate, and it's going to be a panel with um, uh, Alexander, which is basically looking at the question of racial profiling or chasing spies. Um, Alexander Greer, the co-chair of the Committee of Concerned Scientists uh, and a chemistry professor at Chinese University. Uh, sorry, not Chinese. I just came back from Hong Kong. So at, at CUNY, City University. Ruth Jin, who's a founding partner at Jin and Capel, and Peter Zeinberg, a partner at Arendt Fox, and Peter um, represented. Uh, Professor C at Temple University in his case. So let me hand the mic over to Fred Yet, and then we'll get on with the program. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Um, welcome everyone to this uh, discussion on um, the situation that uh, the Chinese Americans, especially the scientists and engineers, <coughs> are facing now in the US. Um, I'm Fred Yan, the current president of uh, Chinese Association of Science and Technology, Greater New York chapter. Um, I'd first like to thank China Institute for hosting this event, and especially the tireless effort of Dinda and Amina uh, for making this happen. Uh, and also I'd like to thank our distinguished panelists for coming forward to lead the discussion on such a um, sensitive issue. So this is a challenging time for the U.S.-China relations. And China is perceived to be in contention with the U.S. for global, global dominance. Uh, whether it's true or not, uh, we as Chinese Americans are called in between. Um, as you have all learned from the news, the FBI director, the vice president, and the president himself has repeatedly say, repeatedly um, claimed that um, Chinese are taking a societal approach in stealing U.S. Uh, intellectual property, um, implying that every one uh, of the Western Chinese uh, society is a potential spy. Um, I want to ask everyone here, um, to raise your hands if you disagree with this thing. Disagree. 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 Okay. Well, a lot of people disagree, and some people may agree uh, or uh, not sure. So that's why we want to have this discussion. Um, <coughs> we think that the vast majority of Chinese Americans are <coughs> honest and law-abiding people, and quietly and diligently working, contributing tremendously to the U.S. economy, to the development of science and technology. Uh, and also directly indirectly to the national security of this country. But in recent years, there are more and more <coughs> espionage cases against ethnic Chinese scientists and engineers. There are public cases like Professor Xi's case uh, that you can hear about in a few minutes. And there are an increasing number of investigations. Some are <coughs> convictions, uh, some are dismissed. But even if they're dismissed, the, the people uh, who are charged, their careers, or, uh, and reputation will badly damage, and they're burdened with hefty lawyer fees. Um, for our organization, the members reported that they were paid visits by the <coughs> FBI uh, to be told that they, they could be they could be potential security risks, and asked to report uh, any suspicious activities uh, of people they know. So this makes people in the Chinese, uh, ethnic Chinese science and technology community feel very uncomfortable. And there is widespread fear, as a lot of people are not sure what to do. So as a networking and educating uh, organization, we have been educating our members and community on IT laws and regulations, 
uh, and just two weeks ago we published a, a, an interview on these issues. And uh, we have to strictly abide by laws and follow company or university uh, regulations. But, as I just mentioned, even if, even as we are following all the rules, uh, there's still confusion. And for example, what can we do, what not do, as regards to visit China, visiting China, or uh, dealing with people in China? And there's further fear that's derived from the government policy, uh, with all these proposed restrictions on technology access to Chinese. Our and our children's career choices will be restricted. <laughs> So um, that would not be right, uh, and this is not good for anyone. Uh, so we hope to start up this discussion. Uh, besides educating our community on IP law, ethics, and guidelines, we want to let general public know about the situation uh, and to look at the various aspects of it. And we also want to engage uh, the law enforcement uh, policymakers and lawmakers to work together to improve. So we hope that China and the U.S. have good relations. Above all, after all, the two countries are facing the same challenges in many aspects, uh, educating and training proficient workforce um, uh, when technology is drastically reshaping the economy. And there is uh, uh, environmental protection and remediation, healthcare, especially senior care, etc. Uh, they can do so much together. And as on this, the Chinese Americans can play an important role. So hopefully we can have a, a virtual discussion. Thank you. Well, I'll just be quick. My name is uh, Haipei Shu Shu Haipei. I'm the president of uh, United Chinese Americans. Uh, what uh, we have uh, been doing is uh, going around the country and trying to get our Chinese American community uh, be aware of this change, the new reality, the new normal, uh, and trying to uh, also um, let our community know what to do, what they're supposed to do, what is uh, different. But I think more importantly, uh, we would also like our law enforcement and our own government <coughs> to know why there's such a widespread concerns uh, and why some of the behavior, some of the act, action are questionable uh, in terms of uh, in the eyes of the law, in the eyes of our civil rights. Um, so we're here. I tell you that we are uh, in a historical moment right, at this very moment. And it takes not just us, take all of us here tonight to be concerned about it to act as what a citizen is supposed to do and to, to care for this country um, without uh, saying too much. And, uh, can I, yeah, I'm done with my talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, who, who shall I give the mic next to? Uh, well, anyway, I can say that. Well, um, at this point, as you probably have known, some of you have known that uh, about 13 of top most prestigious American universities have issued a public statement on this concerning and deteriorating situations. These are wonderful examples of Americans who, who have this fine tradition of uh, uh, observe, uh, uh, respecting the civil rights, respecting the due process and, uh, of this country. Um, we are we are hope, we are working on more universities to do the same thing. And if any of you have any contact with any universities or some faculty members, please do that. Uh, more universities will issue such a statement in the coming weeks. At the same time, we are also doing uh, the national security dialogue across the country uh, between FBI and the federal prosecutor and the Chinese communities, because this two community, however important this issue is, this two community has never met together, and uh, we are caught in the middle. So let's remember the history, and uh, I'll give, uh, give the mic to, uh, to them. Thanks. Yeah, and just like, thank you so much.
microphone and point to your mouth so that everybody can hear you. And wave your hand if you can't hear, okay? Well, thank you everybody for, for coming. Thank you for your audience here. And it is uh, my privilege to be up here with uh, Professor Sheen and Professor Ju. So thank you both for taking the time uh, to come here. And you know, th this, over the course of the next 30 to 40 minutes, you know, you'll have an opportunity to hear from uh, Professor Ju and Professor Ju about their experiences, their impressions, and, and, and their thoughts on this very important and critical topic uh, at this time. Um, you know, the, the, uh, as the title of this presentation you know, talks about you know, certain things that are going on in the U.S. with regards to uh, ethnic Chinese or Chinese American or, China, or naturalized U.S. citizens or Chinese, uh, Chinese nationals who are here in the U.S. Uh, you know, as academics in the science and technology field. And you know, over the course of the past several years, there have been, as, as I'm sure as all of you are aware, a number of cases uh, that, that some lawyers that are here have, have been engaged in and have defended um, involving a number of you know, Chinese, uh, Chinese scientists. You know, in, in 2014, you know, um, there was a case that two scientists at Eli Lilly were arrested and for, for setting data to China and then you know, within about 15 months thereafter, that case was uh, dismissed. There was a case um, of a hydrologist with the National Weather Service uh, who was arrested in October of 2014 you know, for sending secrets to China, and that case was dismissed in March of 2015. Uh, another case in 2017 of a new scientist, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, that, again was, that again was dismissed. And, you know, uh, Professor Xi's case that, that, that he talked about, you know, in 2015, when he was arrested in, in May of 2015, and then his case dismissed up to in late September of 2015. And, and this continues on today, where, you know, very into, into now, where we're back in as recently as um, um, April of this year, some, professor, some researchers at MD Anderson uh, University in uh, Texas were, were removed from their positions uh, for sending some can for allegedly being involved in sending some cancer related information uh, to China. So this is a, a very hot topic and a very timely topic and I'm just privileged to be here with these two professors who can shed some you know, some valuable insight on this from their own personal experiences and what they see every day. So with that, you know, Professor Xi, uh, we'll start with you, and I'm wondering if you can uh, share with us, share with the audience, you know, some information about your encounter with with the FBI and, and the Justice Department. And you know, before you do that, if you could just give us a little bit, you know, of a background. And I would ask to do this in, in very layman's terms, as as you know, reading your your Professor Ju's bio, I, I still I don't think I can understand the English of what they actually do. Um, so just to really brief. About what you do. Okay, thank you, Lonnie. Uh, I, I will try. And <clears throat> so, uh, I am a uh, experimental materials physicist. Right? And uh, I do basic research uh, using single crystal like uh, synthetons, um, something of a uh, uh, hundred thousand of an inch in thickness. And uh, so, my research group study. Uh, the fundamental properties of uh, superconductors, semiconductors, insulators, and which could uh, impact their applications. Uh, so in today's science, uh, it is key to collaborate broadly with scientists uh, in order to create knowledge that has uh, great impact. So um, of about uh, 350 uh, papers that I have published in referee journals, uh, the majority of them are the result of my collaboration with uh, scientists around the world. So I never imagined that my academic collaborations could become the cause of my encounter with the Department of Justice and the FBI. Um, so the, uh, uh, in an early morning, uh, four years ago, an armed FBI agent uh, raided my house and uh, arrested 
And uh, so they uh, rushed into my house and put handcuffs on me and rounded up my wife and, and two daughters at gunpoint. And uh, so my younger daughter was only uh, 12 years old at the time. So uh, watching a scene that I had known only from movies and news uh, reports unfolding in my own house. So I told myself, do everything they say so that they don't shoot me. And uh, so I, I had absolutely no idea why this was happening. And they refused to tell me. And uh, so one day took me, took me away uh, right in front of my family. I thought about the Cultural Revolution in China. Right? And, and at that time, it was not unusual for people being taken away and could not see their family for a long time. And so I didn't know why they arrested me. And uh, uh, only after, you know, after the DNA sampling, mug shots, and the fingerprinting, and also a two-hour interrogation, uh, and also after I insistently asked for the reasons of my arrest, uh, the uh, FBI agent uh, finally told me that I was charged for having made a pocket heater. It's a device covered by a non-disclosure agreement with a U.S. company for a collaborator in China. And the very first words coming out of my mouth were, that's absurd. I knew for a fact that it was not true. And it could not be true. I had never shared the information about the pocket heater with anybody in China. So uh, there were four charges um, against me by the DOJ. Uh, they are based on four emails that I sent from my Temple University address to uh, colleagues in China. They, they, uh, none of the emails uh, talk about the pocket heater. The, the, they were all about something else. And they were all based on my own widely published uh, research. Even so, you know, uh, our life was changed just in an instant. One day I was a respected researcher and the chair of the department. And overnight I was painted as a, a Chinese spy all over the news and the internet. And uh, I faced uh, up to 80 years in prison and a million dollars in fine. And everything I had worked for over 30 years, right, the uh, career, the reputation, the livelihood, could all be gone. So the, uh, you know, the life was like hell in the first several days after my arrest. And it never got better. It didn't get better. Still, we had to make some pressing, con consequential, uh, a, a tough decision. Like how to find a good lawyer, and how to pay the astronomical uh, legal fees. And uh, so, um, the uh, I was, uh, you know, I uh, I was very fortunate to have found. Uh, a team of great lawyers, <coughs> I, led by Peter, who is sitting in the audience, and uh, and, and, and the, uh, the leading expert in my research field uh, also provided affidavits to affirm that I had never shared the pocket heater uh, technology with China. And uh, my lawyers made a presentation about the science of the case to the government. And we also shared a draft motion to dismiss the indictment with the government. And 16 weeks after my arrest, the government dropped the case. So um, even though the charges were dropped, our life was wrecked. And uh, professionally, emotionally, and uh, physically, and uh, financially. We spent over $220,000 for the legal fee. And during the, during the four months I fought the, uh, the false charges, I was not able to do my research. Uh, I was no longer the principal investigators of the uh, grants and contracts I had. 
and I was not allowed to appear on campus, and I was not allowed to talk to my student. And uh, so this uh, ordeal interrupted uh, my productive scientific career. And so at the, at the time of my arrest, I had nine federal grants and contracts, and currently I have two. There were 15 students, postdocs, and senior personnel in my research group at that time, and now there are three. And uh, it, it, it's almost four years after they dropped the case, but I, was sti I still worry constantly whether the government will twist something I do to charge me. Do you, do you feel as though today, giving us those numbers of, of grants that you have compared to what you had, giving us the number of postdoctoral students compared to what you have, do you feel like your has your reputation, do you feel like been been reestablished? Have, have you been able to overcome that or is it something you'll ever be able to overcome? Um, life will never be the same. Right? And uh, for events so traumatic, it's going to uh, be with me for the rest of my life. And uh, so, uh, the, the facts are multifaceted. There, there are many ways that affect my life. Are you able to, to collaborate with, with your peers in the field? Or do you feel like your peers in the field don't want to collaborate with you as much? Um, again, it's a very complicated, and I don't think I can explain that, uh, just very simply. And, but, the, uh, but an active effect is there, and, uh, and I will have to live it for the rest of my life. So, as you know, you live through this experience, and now you see that there, there are other, other instances. Today, um, I start, sorry, today, you know, uh, scientists of, of you know, Chinese ethnic origin, you know, what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think about when you see these, these stories come up in, in, in the news? You know, so let me say this. I said that I still worry whether the government will twist something I do to charge me. And there is a reason for fear, to be fearful. So, um, you know, we heard a lot, the top law enforcement uh, officials say that Chinese scientists, uh, professors, students are not traditional collectors for China. While we, 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 we hear another say that Chinese students and scientists are not welcome because they steal U.S. secret. So if you ask me, in my case, what is the U.S. secret? Not only did I not do what they charged me for, but the puppy eater they accused me of stealing was no secret. What do you, what do you, what do you mean by that? It was publicly, it was well known in the public domain. It was not sensitive, not classified, not trade secret, not export control. It's definitely not a revolutionary military technology. The DOJ press release made it sound like. It was invented by a German company. And then again, after all, I didn't steal it for China. So having experiences, how can I not be fearful. And so uh, what I did do, right, what I did do was collaborating with colleagues in China. But uh, you know, these are um, basic research and um, information that was published. It's a, it's a basic, it's a open research. These collaborations were for advancing sciences and for publication. And never for personal gain. The only thing personal was for me to see my aging parents during my trips to China. So, you know, having experienced all this, I have been warning people that the uh, openness in basic research at U.S. universities is under attack. And, and uh, and this threat is becoming increasingly more uh, serious. Right. So we heard, let's say, a top law enforcement, uh, enforcement official say that collaborating with a researcher at a university in China is passing information to Chinese government. Let me tell you more. 
we hear that when you put unclassified documents together, it creates a classified document. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think I published a briefing paper recently. In there, it says, even if the technologies and their applications are not currently classified, they could be in the future. <laughs> and China seeks to obtain this information before it is classified. So, Chinese scientists are suspected of stealing U.S. secrets uh, anyway, even while we talk about fundamental uh, science and publish results with, with colleagues in China. So, this is wrong, right? Open research is open. Let me read something uh, that, uh, you know, once we publish the result, everybody can read it. So in a recent statement, the National Science Board said, fundamental research is built on open exchanges of ideas and information. These scientific values value or mirror American ideals for our freedom a combination that has helped our country lead the world in technology, driven our economy, and that in turn protects our freedom. And then this statement quoted President Reagan. The strength of American science requires a research environment con conducive to creativity, an environment in which the free exchange of ideas is a vital component. And this statement also quoted uh, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice. The key to maintaining U.S. technological preeminence is to encourage open and collaborative, collab co collaborative basic research. The linkage between the free exchange of ideas and scientific innovation, prosperity, and the U.S. national security is undeniable. So I will say that restricting open fundamental research stifles American innovation in science and technology. You know, let, let, me, let me tell you something more. <laughs> Collaborating with scientists in China is what U.S. government universities encourage us to do. Let me give you some e example. On July 1st, 2014, NIH director Francis Collins told an audience at Fudan University in Shanghai, China, quoting Louis Pasteur, that science knows no country because knowledge belongs to humanity and is the torch which illuminates the world. I'll tell you something else. <laughs> On January 16, 2015, MD Anderson Cancer Center received China's International Science and Technology Cooperation Award for its ties to sister institutions in China, with which it shares collaborative program, program, programs at an event attended by Chinese President Xi Jinping. So, so you know... Yeah, no, I, I, I think that, that, that's, that's very interesting. Let me, let, let me just transfer to, to Professor Zhu for a minute, because I know our time, our time is, is, is limited, and, and so thank you very much for that, for the privilege. Professor Chu, you know, just transferring to you and having heard, heard Professor Xi here, what is, what would you say is the mood among scientists at, at, at Princeton, you know, today? And are universities like Princeton and others coming under pressure from, from, from government authorities? Um, so let me answer the question. I think that right now it's really a difficult time in the academia. So let's first thank that. Uh, Can I ask you to put your microphone right back? Thank you. So let's first thank that uh, Dinda and also Fred and uh, uh, created this opportunity uh, for me to have a chance to uh, dialogue with that uh, law enforcement, and the government, and also public. We try to take this opportunity, hopefully, starting from today, that form a government policy and the public recognition and also a guideline for research scientists to conduct a win-win policy, not only for researchers, but also for America and for this nation, for humanity in the world. And uh, 
Let me introduce myself and in personal experience. I have to disclaim myself that I come here only representing myself. I'm not representing anyone of Chinese a community at Princeton University. I'm not in no capacity to representing a Princeton administration. So what I say only uh, on behalf of myself. So I got my undergraduate degree in, in China, in, in Tsinghua University, and then PhD in Japan. And become a faculty in Tsinghua University in Beijing, and then come to the United States. I'll show you that I come to this country, as many of you sitting here today, and those who are watching that uh, maybe the live stream, that this country is a great country. We have problems in the past, we have problems today, and we can always solve it. That's the reason I come here, and you know, hopefully we can find a better solution. So, so what I'm telling you, I didn't have any education experience before I came to this, nor a uh, graduate student, nor teaching experience. I couldn't speak English when I came to Princeton. The student asked me a question, I don't understand what the question was. <laughs> and I, I didn't think that I was qualified for a professor. But Princeton has a lot of a, uh, freedom and uh, a, uh, give us uh, the forgiveness to, for us to try and give you a platform so that you can dance. And that's give to everybody, American or international scholars. We really appreciate it, uh, first of all. So my first research grant from a, a Air Force, when I want no green card, you cannot imagine this will happen probably in China or in another country. And I was selected to the NASA Electric Committee to define that what is that the, uh, the rocketry should develop for the United States in 2009 and 2010. Today you see SpaceX succeed. That was one of the jobs that we want to move space science to uh, a uh, commercial business. Much more efficient and much challenging and interesting. I also served for the NASA committee last year to a, uh, for define what is the future for space station and microgravity science and biological science. And you can see that everybody in this country has a chance to serve, to serve for the nation, for the humanity. I say, okay. So I come back to your question that what is the mood on campus right now? I said a uh, problem four. The first is that frustration. The frustration was clearly said by Professor Xi was that before we understand that uh, the expert control and the intellectual properties is something sensitive. You have to keep to yourself. And, uh, but today that we are discussing a different dimension. That is that foreign influence in academia. So you, you don't know where to draw the lines. And when you cross the line between academic freedom and that the foreign influence in academia. So that is a frustration. The second thing I would say is that the increasing fear of a new Marxism as a trade war eventually become a technological war and maybe in the end end up with political war. So it pushed us that you have to pick one side, there's nothing between. So the third thing that uh, is really that uh, is inhibiting the morale of people, international scholars, including Chinese, like me, that to conduct academic research and to serve for this nation and for the humanity, as we feel proud uh, before. And it's hurting the atmosphere of international uh, uh, exchange of <coughs> academic ideas. Uh, some of the major conferences, for example, in my field, were no longer held in this country because that is the visa issue, and uh, neither in Asia nor European that support may, may, may support us to have a conference here. We are losing our the center of the state of academic research if we continue to do this work. And for, number four, and more importantly in that, and our president said we want to make a America great again. <coughs> but I would say that uh, what we really need to do is that make America truly greater again. So to doing so in today's atmosphere is counterproductive to make America truly great again. That's what I'm trying to say. So you ask me whether that uh, university feel pressure. And no one will tell you uh, that the government gave university pressure. But you can feel it, right? I threw my eyes 
and through my uh, People's Monument, you can see that uh, many international uh, students and staff or distinguished the faculty uh, employed at Princeton University. They were either get delayed, declined, and then it's in today's environment. And I talked, before I came here, I tried to make sure that what I say is accurate. I talked to the Export Control Office at Princeton. I would advise that today that the government and the funding agency, including NIH, is trying to define, to address the issue of foreign influence in academia. And this is a very complicated and very broad. And every university right now is trying to make more effort than before. They try to uh, define the intellectual properties and the research collaboration and academic uh, exchange under the framework of foreign institute influence in, in academia. Well, that, that brings up an interesting question. I mean, you know, many, you know, science and technology experts work both here in the United States and in China as well. You know, is there some confusion about what is legal and what is not, what you can do, what you can't do? So what I said before, that uh, before it was very clear that uh, anything related to expert control, you know which equipment is expert control and uh, which is uh, your intellectual property is filed to the uh, uh, intellectual property office that you should not share those and uh, and the government contract with any uh, other parties but today that uh, because of the line between foreign influence and that academic exchange it's not clear so let's uh, many people sitting here today may not understand that universities like Princeton never sign a contract which does not allow free publication for example, the CIA give me one million dollars. Say, Professor uh, uh, Jew, and can you do that? We we'll give you one million dollars. Princeton University will say, even I want it. Princeton University will say, no, you can't do it because this is not publishable. So the Air Force and the NASA also have the same framework. So this is a, the tough part. Where do you draw that the line between foreign influence and the academic exchange? Can I, yeah, please. Can I, uh, I think it's just wrong to restrict open research. And it's not just, I say, you know, for, former CIA director John Deutsch said it very clearly. You know, you, you limit university basic research, you're hurting American science and technology and uh, American, uh, you know, competitiveness. That is simply Wrong. That's 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 my opinion. I I, I fully agree. No, let, let me let me tell you something else. <laughs> you know, you talk about working here, working there, and so I, I guess you would refer to Thousand Talents program. Mm -hmm. We're getting there, but go government talent recruitment program is not new. Right. I can tell you that uh, Japanese has the government has World Premier International Research Center initiative. The UK government has the Ernst Rutherford Fund. Canadian government has the Canada 150 Research Shares Program. Singaporean government has RIE 2020. The Israeli government has i -Corps. And the French government has the Make Our Planet Great Again initiative. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, as long as one follows the rules and do not violate laws, I think it's uh, perfectly legitimate for academics to pr pursue opportunities, including Thousand Talents program. I mean, the freedom of movement is a fundamental human right. People should be free to choose where to work and where to live. You have to follow the rule, you have to abide by the law, but once you do that, you should be able to do that. So, what do you both think about, I mean, you know, I'm curious for both your, your Professor Ju, we'll start with you. You know, what do you think about the value of the academic and scientific exchange? What are, what are the dangers if the U.S. were to close its doors to scientists 
from China. I think that uh, the uh, academic freedom and uh, academic exchange is the back backbone of the U.S. The dominance in science and technology. Losing those, that uh, U.S. will lose our dominance in science and technology. So that is far clear. So let me add something to what Professor Xi said, a, a, a talent program. Everybody right now, two years ago, a sound talent program in China, is everybody feel proud that I am one of them, but I'm not. <laughs> and, uh, and every country, indeed, Korea. So I was the Hongbao uh, research uh, uh, world war. I mean, that the, the German age created a, a Hongbao research fellow to give it to distinguished researchers worldwide. And they really become a, a driving force to innovate at uh, German technology. And uh, America, because we are, we feel, not I feel, that our government feel we are dominant. We don't need a talent program to attract anybody. Everybody will come to South America. But today the environment may change. That is going to hurt that the, our continuing leadership in science and technology. So I would say that in America, and, uh, we say that make America a great again, and uh, uh, it's government propaganda, using a uh, tariff or trade war as a tactic, right? In China, they have their own a, uh, strategic plan to uh, improve their science and technology. So many, many people know that China has a lot, had a lot of setback in decades and their technology and economic development is far behind of China. And fortunately, after that, in the 1980s, the Chinese leaders realized that. And the only thing to make China great is that technology and the talent. So let me show you one example that the previous president uh, from, uh, from China, Hu Jintao, he developed his own uh, a campaign for China development. <coughs> They call, in Chinese, they call Guan. If you translate to English, that means a science develop, development philosophy. So the core idea is try to attract talented people, advanced uh, science, to make China a great and eventually a, uh, have a shortcut and then pass the United States. And uh, that is the China dream, right? So China has a different uh, society and the government uh, structure from the United States, we call in the Chinese style. So they have a very top-down structure, structure, and uh, you can say very efficient. You can say that uh, they are very central power, depending on what is positive or negative. But when China's government said that we want to uh, innovate our country, we want to bring talent to this country, they create a different kind of a, a talent program. So when the leader says that, and every institution, from the top to the bottom, they want to show the leaders that we do great things in attracting <laughs> the world top scientists. Not only just Chinese, but also many lower laureates and in, in Ameri American and European countries, right? Well, thank you. That, is, that, was, that was very interesting. Um, I, 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 I know that both professors you know, could speak at length about all this. I do want to give the audience a chance to, uh, to ask a few questions here. Uh, yes, sir. Can you introduce uh, yourself yeah, first? Please introduce yourself. Go ahead. Um, do we have a Chris, microphone? I don't know no. If we have okay. a microphone. Yeah, just speak, speak up. up. Uh, my name is Chris Merck. Um, I have the impression from listening to the two of you that the National Science Foundation is attempting to hold to our traditional standard that things that are classified are classified and other things should be published, whereas NIH appears to be responding more broadly to the kind of suspicions that, that uh, Director Ray has expressed and is, for example, asking universities to conduct investigations to prove that bad things are not going on completely in the absence of any evidence that something might be a problem. <coughs> is, that, is that impression correct that there's a different in, different approach at NIH from NSF, and if so, what can you do about it? No, I, I, I think I read you what uh, uh, Francis Collins has said uh, back in 2014. That, you know, uh, that's what Francis Collins said. And, uh, but, but, you know, I, I don't know what they're thinking, but uh, I read the news report 
that uh, the people at uh, the administration at the uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center put it very clearly. We need to protect our NIH funding. They said that in the news report. And I, said, I think uh, in, a, in, in a hearing, in some, at uh, several hearings, people from NIH said very clearly, FBI was very actively involved in all these uh, investigations. You know, that's why, that's why I think what's happening uh, at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center and the Emory University uh, are very concerning. So, uh, just like in my case, it all started from FBI gaining access to email accounts of Chinese scientists. From my own experience, I know when top law enforcement officials put the entire group of Chinese scientists under suspicion of spying for China. That would mean some FBI agent is reading your emails, is listening to your phone calls, trying to pick bones out of an egg. Right? So I, I don't know the situation details of these cases at MD Anderson or Emory. Maybe there were bones in some eggs. Maybe there's no bone. Right? So I, I think you know, singling out an entire you know Chinese scientist and engineer for targeting. That's racial profiling. Right? That's contrary to American side. So let me add a few few my personal let me let me add a few points that uh, as I said, Princeton University does not allow any kind of a secret research. So we are funded by NIH, and uh, we are funded by DOD, uh, NASA, and DOE, and NSF. Personally, I never had done any research with NIH, but I was funded by DOD and NASA. So the basic let, research... Let me say, I have never done any classified research. <laughs> <laughs> everything is basic research. I publish everything I do. Right. I think that all the, if you think that all the prosecutions and uh, either the wrongdoing or they pick up that uh, a inappropriate sharing of reviewing the proposals or that the uh, not appropriately disclose their, their, their job or their income or their service in China. That are the main problems. Not really that any sensitive things has been shared in these cases. Hi, uh, I'm Frank Wu, Committee 100. I have, a, thank you. Uh, I have a question that's entirely sympathetic and supportive. Uh, you're making two different arguments. One is that what's happening is bad for science, bad for the U.S. national interest. The other argument is that it's uh, bias, that it's discrimination based on race, ethnicity, national origin, color skin. My question is this. What if you found persuade people other than those of us in this room? What argument will help us reach out to those not of ethnic Chinese background, not interested in China, who just read the newspaper and are thinking, well, there is competition with China. What argument do they find compelling? Because I want to help you. I, I want to figure out what is the argument to the average person or civil rights advocate who might be African American, let's say. What appeals to them? How can we reach out so they care about this? Because we're very upset, but how do we get others to be upset? Well, I think it's important uh, that, you know, I come here to say this, that uh, uh, actually uh, he said it very, very clearly, that we're talking about open research. Fundamental research. We're not talking about classified information. You should not. You should not tell people classified information. You should not tell people sensitive information. But we are talking about the open research. You know, paper is published. Everybody can read it. What do you mean by stealing? It's out there. I'm persuaded, but I'm thinking some people aren't professors. Some people aren't scientists. Some people, when you say research. They've never done research, have never encountered research, they know nothing about science. Right? So, so, let me how, add, how, how do we research? So, Frank, let me add a one point here. 
It's not because that the fundamental research uh, carries secrets. Uh, it is more because that uh, the U.S. is fear that uh, China is catching up, and in the past in the United States, we are losing the dominance in technology, and we are losing the dominance in economy. Right. So I went to the Air Force review, a uh, program review. I saw a lot of people from Eastern Europe, our allies, and they were there. And uh, of course, China, North Korea, Iran will never be allowed there. Now, are they doing not the common science as we do? Nature science should be universal to anyone. It is because they're not our allies, right? I think that right now we are sandwiched there. It is because it was not a problem five years ago because that uh, uh, President Obama needs the help from China to solve the climate problem. But today it's become a problem because climate is not a problem. The problem is that <laughs> <laughs> America is left behind. I will give you one example. The research spending at the Tsinghua University last year is about the 7 billion US dollars. If we guess that which university can pass that number, Ivy League school, only one, mm. barely, right? Wait for two more years later. So how can America maintain our a science dominance? You cannot close your door just using that restricted funding to do American research. American research doesn't work. We have to, I, let me finish a little bit. I give you one more example. 18 years ago, I came to America. For National Science Foundation, every professor can apply a basic research grant with $150,000 per year, okay? Today, 2019, in June, so if you write a proposal to NSF, you will be told that you can only write $100,000 per year, right? Can America continue to compete? We are leading, yes. We are not leading in every area and we are not dominant in the area anymore. This is the problem, right? So we have, I think this is the last question, so I'm actually gonna use my authority here to take the last question. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I, start with, I have a question for both of you, let start with you, Professor Ju. What would you recommend, you know, if you were put in a position of policy making, what would you recommend the U.S. do for a win-win policy here for you know, Chinese American scientists in the U.S. I mean, what would you say would be the, 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 the best go forward path? So I think that the uh, as I said, the problem is that the the mistrust between these two uh, superpowers, right? Really, that I think the win-win policy is that uh, and uh, United States need to engage China, not turn China into the enemy that we continue to reform. We're using the same language, we're using the same law, the same value, so that we don't have to say black and white anymore. Right? So I think that one thing I was joking when I came here, I said that, that uh, in America, a contract, a law, it is a law, right? The president cannot change. But in China, a contract, a law, will be trumped by administration and power, right? So why so many uh, Americans, uh, scholars, not just Chinese, signed on the Tan's Son Professor program? It's because they thought, of course, they are distinguished, of course. And uh, second is that the flexibility of a Chinese government and to sign the contract. The contract says you have to work there for at least three months to 10 months, right? Everybody said, no, I cannot do it. Or I have to serve for a person for 10 months at least. And he said, wait, 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 you only can stay there for one month. And uh, your working days in, at, in, in, in the United States even can count. So this is that the non-common language between this country. I think the United States needs science and administration and needs to engage with China to help that they, we bring a, uh, a same value, right? So that same law, a similar value, so that that will really a, create a win-win policy, not only for this country, but also for the world. Professor Well, uh, uh, I just 
read John Deutsch, the former CIA director. Right? And uh, it's fertile to maintain U.S. competitiveness and its lead in early stage innovation by trying to keep others out, or for that matter, our ideas in. The only effective response to China's growing capacity, capability, is to master the new intellectual frontiers and continue, continue to recruit the most talented workforce able to rapidly translate new ideas into practice. In this regard, the United States should continue to welcome Chinese and other science and engineer graduates to U.S. universities and liberalize immigration green card requirements to assure adequate supply for U.S. industry. That will be a win-win. Jinda, thank you, and Fred, thank you for, for, for making this all possible. Thank you. Thank you.